Thank you so, so much. Thank you, Rabbi Rittenberg. Thank you, Emmet, the great extraordinary organization, the Emmet Outreach Center, located at Center in Queens, New York. Thank you for this great privilege and invitation and opportunity. We had a schmooze, we had a class together a few weeks ago, just during the beginning of the crisis or closer to the beginning of the crisis. And here we are now, once again, this evening, I really want to welcome the hundreds and hundreds of people who are joining us from MS via Zoom chat. I want to welcome the hundreds of people joining us via the yeshiva.net. I want to welcome the hundreds of people joining us via Torah Anytime and the various live streams, YouTube, etc. We have Jews literally gathered here, of course, from New York, from Emmet, but literally from all over the world. Uh, even people who are not sleeping much these days in Europe, in Israel, uh, they're also joining us now. So I want to welcome all of you from the United States, all of you from Europe, from uh, South Africa, from Asia, of course, from our Holy Land and Australia, wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. I send you my deepest loves, love and blessings and prayers to stay healthy. And as Rabbi Rutenberg said, tonight's class is dedicated for the special and beloved memory of Rabbi Yosef Chai and Margarita, a extraordinary couple, beacons of, of love and and light and camaraderie and and dedication. And I want to welcome their family and thank you for making this happen. And thank you all of you for uh, being here. The great advantage of doing this over Zoom and over technology is you could fall asleep in middle of my presentation and I will not take it to heart. <laughs> Even though with Zoom, I could see some of you, but you could fall asleep. Also, you can chew gum, you can uh, crack nuts, you can eat, you can uh, enjoy your ice cream, which usually is difficult and distracting for me when I give a lecture, but now feel free and live it up and knock yourself out, my dear friends. So Rabbi Rutenberg, the director of MS, who has become a, a, a very special friend, asked me to address this evening a very important and a very loaded topic, and it's called developing a personal, intimate relationship with God. And uh, I think this is, I thank you for choosing this topic because I think it's a unique opportunity today to focus on this question. How do I develop a personal, real, authentic, and intimate relationship with God? As Rabbi Rutenberg said, everybody is welcome to send in their questions. I'm going to speak. And then after my presentation, we will take questions. You could share whatever is on your mind, on your heart, on your soul. Rabbi Rutenberg will read your questions. You can also type them in on the yeshiva.net if that's easier for you, if you're not on Zoom. And I will look up the questions over there as well. Leaneder. So, you know, one of the brilliant things that came out in this entire devastating pandemic is extraordinary humor. Sometimes I get clips with such great anecdotes and, and jokes. People's sense of humor has really accelerated. I guess in a time of crisis, humor is one of the, one of the great tools to release tension. The old saying goes, what you can laugh at, you can survive. That's why the Jewish people have always had a niche for humor. The name of the first Jewish boy is Yitzchak. Yitzchak means... He shall laugh. Why would the first Jewish boy, born a Jew, be named He Shall Laugh? And the answer, perhaps, is God was giving us a lesson. He said, that which you can laugh at, you will be able to survive. Not only survive, but you will be able to emerge from it more strong and more blessed. So allow me to begin with an anecdote about two Jews, Mr. Berkowitz and Mr. Rabinowitz. If there is a Mr. Berkowitz and Rabinowitz, with us tonight. It's not you, it's your fourth cousin once removed. Mr. Berkowitz and Mr. Rabinowitz were business partners. They were also avid golfers. They loved golf. Anyway, one day Berkowitz calls up his friend Rabinowitz and he says, Rabinowitz, listen up. These buyers we have been schmoozing up and trying to cultivate their business 
called to say that they have a reservation for us to meet them, to play golf at their exclusive country club. It's going to be this coming Saturday at 9 o'clock a.m. It's exclusive. It's extraordinary. This is going to be private, intimate time with them. An unbelievable opportunity for business. Rabinowitz tells his friend Berkowitz, he says, sorry, I can't go. It's Shabbos. It's Saturday. Nine o'clock in the morning, Saturday, I am in the synagogue. I am in shul. This, of course, is pre-corona days. Saturday morning, you go to synagogue. So uh, Rabinowitz tells Berkowitz, I can't go. When <clears throat> Berkowitz hears this, he says, what? Shul, shmul, what are you talking about? This is a big deal. This is an opportunity of a lifetime. You can't reject such an opportunity to go golfing with these multimillionaires. Besides, you are going to shul? Since when do you go to shul? <laughs> I know you. Rabinowitz, you're going to shul? I have known you for decades. You're an atheist. When we were kids, you were a communist. You're going to shul? Rabinowitz says, listen, this was all before Mr. Goldstein came to town. You remember? Mr. Goldstein came to town as a refugee. He didn't have a penny in his pocket. Now, he's a multimillionaire. Some say he may be worth billions. And Goldstein tells me that it's all because he goes to shul and he talks to God. Rabinowitz! Rabinowitz! Berkowitz screams. You expect me to believe that you are going to shul to talk to God? Come on. You're a radical atheist. Don't tell me Bubba Mises. We got to go golfing. And Rabinowitz responds. He says, no, 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 no. You don't get it. You don't understand. Goldstein goes to shul to talk to God. I go to shul in order to talk to Mr. Goldstein. It's one of these old Jewish anecdotes, which of course expresses the fact that very often life, Jewish life, can become routine. We go through the same patterns, the same habits. We do the same thing every day. Before Corona, some of us were going to shul every Shabbos or every day or Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And very often, you're not sure if he's going to talk to God or he's going to talk to Goldstein or he's going to assuage and calm down his grandmother or he's going for a Kiddush or for a Bar Mitzvah. What's missing often is the intimate, personal relationship. Today, nobody's going to synagogue. There are a few people who are still going to synagogue and they're not doing the right thing. But most of us are doing the right thing and they're not going, we're not going to synagogue, we're quarantined. Now, very often, people look at it as, what's this decree? All the shuls are closed down. The schools are closed down. It's sad, and we look forward to be reunited with our communities, not just through technology, but also physically. But we have to remember something, and that is in Judaism, every single crisis is always seen as an opportunity. Never, ever allow a crisis to go by without maximizing its potential. And the same is true with the present pandemic of COVID-19. Woe unto us if when this madness is over, we just go back to normal life as though nothing happened. And all we're asking for is, come on, let's get the schools open, let's get the stores open, let's get the malls open, let's get the businesses open, let's get the industries, various industries open. Let's be able to go to work in the morning and send our kids to their educational institute so life could go back to normal. We don't have to be quarantined. That's a wonderful wish, and may it happen and happen easily and happen swiftly with everybody fully healthy. However, what a pity it will be for us and for the Jewish people and for the world, for humanity, if we don't emerge from this crisis far deeper far more blessed, far more expansive, far more authentic. I mentioned at another lecture to the South African community 
that when Jacob meets his adversary, that mysterious night in the book of Genesis, and the adversary tries to kill him all night, and finally he can't defeat Jacob, but he dislocates his sciatica. And when the morning comes, when dawn breaks, this adversary, this mysterious warrior or angel who comes to fight Jacob, tells Jacob, Shalcheni, let me go because dawn broke. And Jacob says these immortal words, I will not let you go until you do not bless me. What? Imagine someone is attacked in the middle of the night by a gangster in a dark alley. You're fighting all night. Finally, morning comes and the gangster wants to leave. And you say, wait, 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 wait. I need a bracha. I need a blessing. Jacob, what are you asking for blessings for from this fellow? Call 911, punch him in the nose, let him go. What's this need for a blessing? And of course, the commentators present many different perspectives, but I shall share one. Jacob was bequeathing a timeless lesson to all of his descendants for eternity. Whenever you face adversity in your life, whenever you're confronted by an angel who wants to destroy you, whenever you're dealing with a challenge, an obstacle, a formidable enemy, spiritual, physical, psychological, emotional, financial, social, an enemy within or an enemy without, whenever you're confronted with trauma, with skeletons, with demons, with ghosts, whenever you're dealing with a crisis that it's affecting whether it's your health or the health of your loved ones, your economic situation, the entire community, and in this case, the entire world. It's not only enough to extricate yourself from the grip of your adversary and emancipate yourself and set yourself free. That would be insufficient because if that is your only achievement, the question is why would God put it in your life in the first place? If the entire goal was just I want to extricate myself from your terrifying grip. Why did I need to meet you and engage with you in the first place? Jacob says the message and perspective of Judaism, the Welt am Schaum that sustained the Jewish people for millennia was that at the end of every long night, we looked at the adversary in the eyes and we said, I will not let you go unless... I emerge from this encounter more blessed, more wise, more deep. I want to emerge a transformed person. I don't only want to run away from the coronavirus. Yes, I want to do that too. But I want to seize the opportunity. We want to seize the opportunity to welcome a world that is more unified, a, a world that is more aligned with its true purpose a humanity that is more in touch with its core and its essence. We want a Jewish community that is much more authentic, honest, real, deep, wise. I want to emerge as a much better person, a deeper person, a person of much profounder integrity, wisdom, enlightenment, harmony, and connection. If not, I say, woe unto me, that after such a long night facing this angel, which each one of us faces in our life, all I can say is, let me go back to normal life. Jacob says, don't make that mistake. I will not let you go if I do not become more blessed through you. My dearest friends, this pandemic has devastated many a life. Many of us have lost relatives, parents, grandparents, uncles, aunts, close friends, mentors, teachers, beacons, leaders of our communities. Queens, the community of Queens was struck very, very hard. Just like the community of Borough Park, just like the community of Crown Heights, the community where I live, which is Muncie, New York, and many other communities, they were struck very, very hard. We have lost some of our best, our sweetest, 
and our holiest. Many more are struggling for their life and struggling with health. This is not an easy time for people. And yet we have to always remember that in life we look at every single challenge and we say, I will not let you go if I do not emerge from this more blessed. I remember when I was sitting Shiva for my late father in 2005. And I went out one night to the alley, to the driveway where my parents live in Montgomery Street in Brooklyn. It was a long day, you know, and you're sitting on that low chair for 12 hours and the visitors don't, the visitors don't stop and people come till midnight and after midnight. So I went out, you know, just to get a little fresh air and I was standing outside at the side of the house. And my nephew, my brother's son, comes out as well. And with tears in my eyes, I turn to my nephew and I say, it's the end of an era. My father was really a uh, larger than life personality. He was an institution and uh, he was a real seasoned Jewish journalist for a half a century. So I tell my nephew, he's a very colorful and interesting personality. So I tell my nephew, it's the end of an era. And without skipping a beat, he said something that stayed with me and it was comforting. He said, yes, it's the end of an era, and it's also the beginning of a new one. It struck me. The end of an era could be the end. It can also be the beginning of a new one. When one window closes, a new one opens. When one door is shut, a new opportunity opens. We know that all of us, for the rest of our lives, will refer to pre-corona and post-corona. This is one for the history books, what we're going through now. An invisible virus the size of 125 nanometers has brought 7.7 billion people to their knees. Not a sector in our civilization has not been affected and transformed as a result of this invisible enemy, which you can't see with your naked eye and you need microscope to be able to see these microorganisms. And yet the whole world was changed. Many of us will yet share this with children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Crisis that is unique. The end of an era. But do we just go back to normal? How can we? How can I be deaf? How can I be deaf to the opportunity? How can I be blind to the potential that is being born right now as we speak? There's a tremendous potential and light embedded in every single darkness. And this doesn't mean it's not dark. It doesn't mean we wanted it. It doesn't mean it's not tragic. It doesn't mean there's not a lot of pain in the world. It does mean that we have to make a choice. Do we just look at coronavirus as just one of those devastating crises and that's it and we want to get rid of it? Or we emulate and we repeat the words of our father Jacob. I will not send you away unless I come out more blessed. And one of the key areas that I myself have found myself working on, and I think is extremely relevant to so many of us, is with the shuls closed down, with shopping centers and malls closed down, we all retreated to our own corner, our own home. We can't daven anymore with a community. We cannot study anymore physically with a community, although we're using this technology and it's amazing. Our kids are not going to school. They're being homeschooled, even if they have school through the house. It's a very different reality. Many of us, most of us are not going to work. So now when I get up in the morning to pray, it's just me alone, me and God alone. <laughs> Is this sad? On some level, on some level, it's an amazing opportunity. This is the time to develop a personal relationship with God. And it's not only through prayer, it's throughout the day. Whenever we are struck with a difficult moment in life, we can do one of two things. We can become cynical or we can become deeper. We can simply resort to survival instincts, which is normal, or we can discover our innermost strengths. We can allow our innermost light, the core of our personality, a part of ourselves that we usually are not in touch with. 
we can get in touch with. And I say to you, my dearest sisters and my dearest brothers, open yourself up to that opportunity because these things don't happen often and we don't want them to happen often. Please God, everybody should be healthy. But when such a thing comes into our world, carpe diem, seize the day, I will not let you go until you bless me. What does my relationship with God look like? What does your relationship with God look like? Do we have a personal relationship with God? What does prayer mean? What does davening mean? The prophet Jeremiah says in Lamentations, Shifchi chamayim libech noichach pnei Hashem. Let your heart pour forth like a water current in the presence of the face of God. What does that look like to pour out your heart as though there was a waterfall in your heart? What does this mean? And this is what I want to address during the remaining time of our class, ways of internalizing and experiencing a profound relationship with God throughout the day, but one particularly focused on the art of prayer, because prayer is the time when the Torah established the meeting place and the meeting time between the human person and the Almighty on a daily basis. The Jewish religion, we have three prayers a day, morning, afternoon, evening, shacharit, mincha, mayrif. On the Sabbath uh, holidays, we have four. On Yom Kippur, we have five. What are these meetings about? What is supposed to happen? What are we trying to accomplish? Many people find prayers to be, as they have shared with me over the years, at best, monotonous, boring. Sometimes they actually get anxious. It triggers all types of negative emotions. And I want to try to help you and me change our paradigms, expand our horizons, and really see how and we can cultivate a much deeper and more authentic relationship with God. The first and foremost understanding of what a relationship with God looks like, of what prayer looks like, I experienced a few years ago, one day in a building I lived in Brooklyn on New York Avenue. I was living in a building there and I went to get the mail. And when I went out to get the mail, I had to go upstairs to the fourth floor where my sister-in-law was living. And I went to the elevator and I see a lovely African-American brother who seemed like an electrician or a plumber standing at the elevator and he's talking. He's talking and talking, making with his hands. So I thought that he has an earpiece and he's on the telephone. When I got closer, I saw that he didn't have anything in his ear and he was just talking. And I wondered about that, you know, cause he had this animated conversation and I turned to him and I said, Holy brother, do you mind if I ask you a question? He said, go ahead, my brother. I said, who are you talking to? I thought you had a headset or an earpiece. You're talking on the phone. I see you got nothing. Who are you talking to? You're talking to yourself. Who are you talking to? And he tells me, he says, I'm talking to God. I said, really? You're standing at the elevator and talking to God? He says, yeah. You know, I have a very hard day. I'm working very, very hard. So I stop at the elevator. I have a few minutes. Yeah, I'm waiting for the elevator. We had a very slow elevator in our building. You could wait there 20 minutes for the elevator, 10 minutes, whatever it was. He says, whenever I have an opportunity, I share with God what I have been experiencing. And I share with God what I'm going to experience. And I ask him for his guidance and his help. So I said, so what were you talking now to God about? 
He said, I was talking to God about where I'm coming from. I was talking to God about where I'm going. I'm going to this and this apartment. I have to accomplish this. I still have to go here and go there and go there. And I'm asking for God to be with me and help me. That's what I'm doing. And I'm standing there perplexed and inspired. And I thought to myself, wow, this African-American brother is teaching me something so powerful about prayer. It's real. It's real. He was standing in front of an elevator and talking to God. I thought he's talking on the phone. I once heard from Dr. Tversky that he was once at the Kaisel, at the Kotel, at the Western Wall in Jerusalem. And he was standing there and he was praying, I think it was Mincha, the afternoon service at the wall. And there's a Jew standing there and he hears the Jew, he's not eavesdropping, but he's standing there, he hears a Jew talking to the wall. And the Jew starts talking about a dentist appointment that he went to and what the dentist said or what the dentist did. And then the Jew interrupts himself and he says, oh, Oh, I told this to you yesterday already. I don't have to repeat it. Let's continue. And Dr. Tversky said, at that moment, I learned what prayer is. A Jew is sharing with God what the dentist said yesterday. And then he says, oh, I shared this already yesterday. Let's move on with the conversation. What does this represent? It represents the basic idea in Judaism that we believe At the core of the universe, there is love. The universe is not deaf to your pleas, to your cries, to your experiences, to your emotions. You're not just a random mutation, an insignificant blimp on the surface of infinity. You live and you die and crumble when the time comes based on some random equation. You were conceived in love. You were created with a mission. Birth is God saying you matter. And birth is God saying that something in the world will remain incomplete without your presence, your light, and your contribution. The glorious institution of prayer is the idea that every single person must know that God wants to hear what is going on in your life. Share it with him. So you'll say an infinite God wants to know what's happening in my life. Yes, that is the essence of of, of one of the most fundamental ideas in Judaism. The universe is not blind to your agony, deaf to your suffering, oblivious to your journey. At the core of reality is the presence of, the consciousness of a divine, infinite, moral, loving creator who loves you infinitely and loves you unconditionally and wants a relationship with you. In parentheses, I am now going to insert a profound philosophical slash spiritual idea. I'm not going to elaborate on it, but I just want to share it. There is an ancient question how we reconcile two opposite ideas in Judaism, God's knowledge and free choice. The question is very simple. It was already raised by Maimonides, Rambam in the Laws of Repentance, I think it's chapter five. Maimonides raises the obvious philosophical question. If God knows the future, so God knows everything Rabbi Y.Y. is going to do tomorrow and next month and next year. And he knows when I'm going to wake up. And he knows if I'm going to do the right thing or the wrong thing. And he knows if I'm going to eat cheesecake, even though I'm not supposed to eat cheesecake. And he knows if I'm going to eat kakush cake, even though I'm not supposed to eat kakush cake. And he knows what Rabbi Rothenberg is going to do for the next 10 years, 100 years, 150 years. And he knows what every single one is going to do. So I don't have choice. How do I have choice? Because if I am forced to do what God knows I'm going to do, so that means I have no choice. My actions are compelled by God's previous knowledge. And if I could choose according to my own volition and conviction and choice, and I can prove God wrong, so then it means God doesn't know everything. So we have a big contradiction. You say God is clueless. God doesn't know what I'm going to choose. No, God does know. If God knows, 
then I can't choose otherwise because by tomorrow it's already predetermined. Interesting question. And the commentators and the philosophers and the Kabbalists and the mystics and the masters of Hashkafa of perspective have spilled much ink on this question. One of the best answers is Maimonides' answer. You know, Maimonides says, Maimonides says, oh, we can't understand. <laughs> you think you're going to understand how God's mind works? God knows, and you have choice. And the Ravid, one of the great commentators on the Rambam, Rabbi Avram Ben David from Pasquires, is very critical. He says, you ask a question, and then you say, oh, we don't understand. Don't ask questions if we don't understand. He's very critical of Maimonides' view. Now, this is not our discussion, so I'm not getting into the details, but I want to share with you a little insight that comes from the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov was the founder of the Hasidic movement. He was born in 1698. He passed away in 1760 on Shavuos. And he revolutionized the landscape of Jewish thought and Jewish life and Jewish experience through his teachings and his students. And he has a very short teaching about this. Now I have to tell you the truth. I'm not sure I understand it. But I think I feel it a little bit. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I understand it, but I think I feel it a little bit. And I'll tell you what the Baal Shem Tov says. The Baal Shem Tov says, of course, God's knowledge is omniscient. God is omniscient, he's omnipresent, meaning he's everywhere and he knows everything. And if his knowledge is infinite, meaning he knows every single detail about everybody's past, present, and future, it's supposed to deny me free choice. And yet the Baal Shem Tov says there's another reality that is as potent, and that is not only God's infinite knowledge, but also God's infinite love. God loves me, God loves you, and God craves more than everything else a personal relationship with you. And for that relationship to be meaningful, you have to have choice. Because if not, you're just a pre-programmed computer. You can't have a real intimate relationship with a computer because a computer is brilliant and marvelous, but ultimately it just is a product of the programmer. What you program in, that's what you get. There's no creativity. There's no choice. So for God to have a real relationship with you, like equals, like partners, like friends, like marriage partners, there's choice. Says the Baal Shem Tev, God's love trumps God's knowledge. So even though his knowledge dictates that I don't have free choice, but God's love to me is even deeper than God's knowledge. And because of the love, I do have free choice. He, so to speak, suspends his infinity to allow for free choice. This is in parentheses. I come back to this key point in Judaism, namely, what does prayer represent? God is not deaf to your life. He wants to know what's going on with you. And that's an incredible idea. The idea of davening, the idea of prayer in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening. It's literally like in a marriage. Your husband, your wife wants to know what is going on with your life. You say, oh, we already spent time yesterday. That's not how a marriage works. If you don't continuously feed the relationship, you start drifting away. That's how marriages work. It's not like other relationships. You have a, cla a classmate, an old friend. Sometimes you don't speak for a couple of months. And then after a couple of months, you call up, you say, hey, Harry, how are you? Oh, George, what's going on? Hey, Sylvia, how are you? Hey, Helene, what's going on? How is everything? How have you been? And you just continue the conversation where you left it three months ago. Try doing that with your wife. Or don't. Yeah? Three months later, oh, I'm back. It doesn't work that way. Why? Because the relationship is so powerful and the relationship is elevated to such a magnitude, and you're dealing with two people who are very different from each other, and yet they're so close to each other that this relationship needs to be fed. It needs to be nurtured. It needs to be nurtured on a daily basis and not just one time a day. And if not, you naturally start drifting away. God becomes vulnerable. The infinite God chooses, he doesn't have to, but he chooses to become vulnerable and say, I'm waiting for you. I want to hear what's going on in your life. Share it with me. I'm not deaf to your situation. That is the first fundamental truth behind prayer and behind developing a personal relationship with God. And it's this feeling, it's this experience that gave men and women of faith 
so much resilience and so much hope. It's not that it takes away all the pain in the world. It's not that faith eliminates pain. People of faith don't struggle. Real people of faith struggle as much as everybody else. What it does do is, it means that there's somebody who cares. There's somebody I can talk to. There's somebody who's ready to embrace me. And you know where you see this most? You see this most in the book of Tehillim, the book of Psalms. And I would encourage you to read through the book of Psalms, but with a translation that you can understand and internalize. Today you have great translations in English and in Yiddish and in Russian and in French and Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, and in a, a Hebrew that is more contemporary. It's worthwhile to read through, even if you could read a chapter, a few chapters a day. It's fascinating book because it's not just brilliant, but the emotions of it. You literally go on a journey with King David and you see how he dealt with crises in life because almost every chapter is dealing with another challenge and another crisis. In fact, the book of Tehillim is divided by the months, by the month, many people finish the Tehillim over the month, over 30 days, because there's like a few chapters you say every day. There's 150 sections, poems in Tehillim over 30 days. You say every day a few chapters, you finish it by the month. Some even, people even finish it during the week. But it's very powerful when you read the book of Psalms, you see what it means to have a personal relationship with God. King David just shares his soul. He shares his agony. He shares his doubts. He shares his fears. He shares his insecurities. He shares his trauma. He shares all of his experiences with his creator. You see that he knows and he feels in every bone of his body that God is not deaf to his cry, nor is God deaf to your life and to your experience. So seize the moment and cultivate that relationship. Talk, share, meditate, connect. That's step number one. Which brings me to step number two. And here, I want to address a very interesting uh, word in Hebrew, in Hebrew grammar. When you say in Hebrew, I'm going to Davin, how do you say it? Those of you who know Hebrew, you say, Ani olech lehit palel. Ani olech lehis palel, or lehit palel, depends if you're Ashkenazic or Sfar. What does lehit palel mean? I'm going to Davin, I'm going to pray. Right now, this is interesting because if you know a little bit Hebrew diction, Hebrew grammar, let's say I want to say, I'm going to dress my child, I'm going to dress my baby. Yeah, say, I'm going to dress my child. What if I want to say, I'm going to get dressed myself, not dress someone else? Then I say, now, prayer seemingly is the idea, I'm going to pray to God. But we don't say that. We say, Ani olech lehit palel. Lehit palel means I'm going to do something within myself. What is this that I want to do within myself? Where does the word tefillah come from? What is the root of the word tefillah, which we translate as prayer? In Genesis, Jacob is separated from his beloved son Joseph for 22 years. 22 years he has not seen his son Joseph since the brothers have taken him and cast him into a pit and sold him into slavery. After 22 years, Jacob is reunited with Joseph. And at the end of his life, he tells Joseph, I never imagined, I never anticipated that I'm going to see your face. And here, not only did God show me you, but God also showed me your children. The word he uses is filolti. Filolti means I didn't, loy filolti, I didn't expect, I didn't imagine, I didn't anticipate. So what is tfila? Tfila means imagination, anticipation. Lehit palel means... Like Lehit Labesh, I'm going to get dressed, I'm going to imagine. I never imagined. So what's Lehit Palel? I'm going to imagine. That's what davening is. What are you going to imagine? <laughs> now who leads the prayer? The prayer is led by a chazan, a cantor. What is the word chazan? Where does it come from? It comes from the word chazoin, vision. 
So the cantor is not just singing the prayers. He's presenting a vision. Chazon is a vision. Chazon Yeshayo. Lehit Palel means I'm going to imagine a vision. I'm going to anticipate something. I'm going to open myself up to a new idea. What is this? What, what is this that I'm opening myself up to? This, my friends, is a very, very powerful idea. Prayer in Judaism is about visionary thinking. What's the visionary thinking of prayer? And the answer is, it's the ability to be able to see myself not just as a small, petty, finite, mortal, limited, moody, struggling creature who got lots of struggles and lots of issues. You can talk with my therapist. But rather, prayer means I am cultivating within myself a vision. I want to be able to imagine myself in a new way. How? I want to be able to imagine myself as an ambassador of the divine in this world, as an extension of God in this world, as a manifestation of God's infinite light in this world, as an ambassador of the divine on our world, an ambassador of infinity, an ambassador of love, light, hope, healing, wisdom, enlightenment, unity, and redemption. You see, there's two dimensions in me. In every single one of us, there's two sides, there's two dimensions. There's a side of me that is filled with fear and anxiety and panic and hysteria and jealousy. Are you familiar with this? If you're not, great, but I have to deal with this. There's a side within me that is petty, small, just operating on survival instincts, fight or flight. But there's another side to me, and the other side to me is deeper. And that's the part of me that is really infinite. It's the part of me that is a manifestation of God. The Tanya says that every person has two souls. We operate on two levels of consciousness. One is called an animal consciousness, and one is called a divine consciousness, which he describes as a chelik eloika mimal mamash. There's a dimension within your core, your consciousness, that is actually a fragment of God. It's a piece of divinity. It's a ray of infinity. It's the manifestation of God's light in this world. A relationship with God every day, particularly during prayer, is the ability to step away from seeing myself only in terms of pettiness and smallness and insecurity, to be able to see myself, to imagine myself for who I really am. And who am I really? I am really a complete partner with the creator of the world. I am God's light in this world. You are God's light in this world. And that's why jealousy always comes from ignorance because nobody can extinguish your light. On the contrary, by you shining your light, you help me shine my light. Everyone has their unique way of manifesting God's light and God's love in this world. You have a unique contribution. You are not just a victim. You're not just a servant. You're much more than that. You're a full partner. You are divine. You're, you are, so to speak, the peace of God that he sends down to planet Earth in order to change the world and to bring light into darkness. Can you imagine yourself from that perspective? Can you make decisions from that perspective? Can you operate from that perspective? Can you communicate with your spouse and your children from that perspective? Can you communicate with yourself from that perspective? Now, this is not easy. This is often very, very challenging, and that's why this relationship needs to be cultivated and nurtured it must blossom. And it's not enough just to do it once a week, once a month, because intuitively, I go back to my insecurities. Intuitively, I go back to my small, tiny, miniature self. A relationship with God means a relationship with myself, with my core, with my deepest, deepest identity as an ambassador of infinity. That's a powerful challenge, but it's also an incredible an incredible opportunity. Now, you know, my dearest friends, I want to share with you two stories. 
two stories about two extraordinary individuals. And they have touched me so deeply because it taught me what a personal relationship with God is. Some of you remember him a few years ago. The Jewish world lost one of its heroes, Dr. Eli Wiesel, Eli Wiesel, Professor Wiesel. I had the privilege of knowing him personally because my late father and the late Dr. Wiesel worked very closely together in journalism for many years, and they remained close friends. I remember one Rosh Hashanah, quite a few years ago, Eli Wiesel penned a letter to God, and he published this letter in the New York Times. And I have to read a few excerpts of this letter that Eli Wiesel published in the New York Times, I think it was a day before Rosh Hashanah, around 20 years ago, 20 or 25 years ago. I read, Master of the Universe, let us make up, it's time. How long can we go on being angry? More than 50 years have passed since the nightmare was lifted. Many things, good and less good, have since happened to those who survived it. They learned to build on ruins. Family life was recreated. Children were born. Friendship struck. Of course, Elie Wiesel lost much of his family in the Holocaust. His father died. His mother died. Siblings he survived Auschwitz, Buchenwald. He wrote his well-known book, Night. And in Night, those of you who read Night, about that, the night, the night of, of Jewish history, Auschwitz, remember how Eli Wiesel describes his, his challenges with God and God's existence, allowing the sight of a child a little child being hung on the gallows by the SS. So 50 years later, he's penning a letter in the New York Times saying family life was recreated. Does this mean, Elie Wiesel writes, that the wounds in their soul have healed? They will never heal as long as a spark of the flames of Auschwitz and Treblinka glows in their memory. So long will my joy be incomplete. What about my faith in you, master of the universe? I now realize that I never lost it, not even over there during the darkest hours of my life. I don't know why I kept on whispering my daily prayers. And I kept on whispering those reserved for the Sabbath and for the holidays, but I did recite them, often with my father and on Rosh Hashanah Eve with hundreds of inmates at Auschwitz. Was it because the prayers remained a link to the vanished world of my childhood? In my testimony, I have written harsh words, burning words about your role in our tragedy. I would not repeat them today, but I felt them then. I felt them in every cell of my being. Why did you allow, if not enable the killer day after day, night after night, to torment, kill, and annihilate tens of thousands of Jewish children? Why were they abandoned by your creation? These thoughts were in no way destined to diminish the guilt of the guilty. Their established culpability is irrelevant to my problem with you, master of the universe. In my childhood, I did not expect much from human beings, but I expected everything from you. Where were you, God of kindness in Auschwitz? What was going on in heaven at the celestial tribunal while your children were marked for humiliation, isolation, and death only because they were Jewish? At one, po one point, I began wondering whether I was not unfair with you. After all, Auschwitz was not something that came down ready-made from heaven. It was conceived by men, implemented by men, staffed by men, and their aim was not only to destroy us, but you as well. Ought we not to think of your pain too, watching your children suffer at the hands of your other children? Haven't you also suffered? As we Jews now enter the high holidays, preparing ourselves to pray for a year of peace and happiness for our people and all people. Let us make up, master of the universe, in spite of everything that happened. Yes, in spite, let us make up for the child in me. It is unbearable to be divorced from you so long. 
Wow. Wow. Friends, when I read this, it struck such a deep chord in me. Elie Wiesel debated and fought God for 50 years. He did not agree with God. He didn't justify the Holocaust. He didn't rationalize it. He wrestled with the divine, but he felt in his bones that there was someone listening to what he was saying. He could speak to God. He can cry to God. He can get upset at God. He can share his heart and his tears with God. Elie Wiesel lost almost everything. His mother, his father, his baby sister were slain by the Germans. On his own skin, he experienced the blackest chapter in Jewish and human history. You know, he refused for many years to get married. He felt that it was unjust to bring Jewish children into a world that would be so cruel. I heard this from him myself. Yet, he rebuilt his life. He got married. He had a boy who he named after his murdered father, Elisha. We both had a bris at the same time. And he inspired millions of people not only to remember the victims of the Holocaust, but to live better and more noble lives. He spent decades fighting peace, fighting for peace and fighting anti-Semitism, standing up to injustice. And for me, it showed what it means to have a personal relationship with God, the power of prayer. He may have wrestled with God. That's what the word Yisrael means. Yisrael means Israel. You have wrestled with God and men and you have prevailed but he knew that he has somebody to wrestle with. There was somebody who was holding him, as King David says in 23, chapter 23 of Psalms, even as I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I shall not fear any evil because you are with me. I'm going to conclude with one more story, which inspired me very, very deeply and inspires me till today. And then we'll open it up to your conversation and your feedback. There was a Jew, many of you remember him. His name was Simon Wiesenthal. Simon Wiesenthal passed away in 2005. He was an Austrian Jew, a Holocaust survivor. He spent four and a half years in German concentration camps, and he dedicated his life to be a Nazi hunter. After the war, he became famous for this work, I think he dedicated most of his life to track down and gather information on fugitive Nazis so they could be brought to justice. A number of years ago, there was a conference of European rabbis in Bratislava, in Slovakia, and the rabbis honored the 91-year-old Simon Wiesenthal with an award. You know what they gave him as a reward? They gave him a siddur, a prayer book. Simon Wiesenthal gets up at this conference and he speaks to the rabbis and he shares with them an experience he had with one of the great American rabbis known as Reb Lazer Silver. Reb Lazer Silver, who passed away in 1968, was among America's foremost Jewish leaders. He was very involved in the Vad Hatzalah in rescuing Jews from Europe and he was the chief rabbi of Cincinnati, he was the head of Agudas Rabbonim, an organization that brought together many rabbis. And Simon Wiesenthal tells the following story. He says, I was in Mauthausen after the liberation. Rabbi Silver came from the United States to help the survivors settle in the DP camps. Rabbi Silver organized a special prayer service, and he invited Simon Wiesenthal to join the other survivors in praying. Simon Wiesenthal turns to Rabbi Lazar Silver and he says, no way, I will not join these prayers. And I'll tell you why. When I was in the camp, I saw many different types of people do many types of things. There was one religious man in whose presence I experienced so much awe, and I'll tell you why. This guy managed to smuggle a siddur, a Jewish prayer book, into the camp I was amazed that he was ready to risk his life in order to bring a siddur, a prayer book, into the camp. To my horror, the next day, my awe of this man was shattered. I realized he was no religious man. He was renting the siddur in exchange for people giving him a little piece of their bread. I was so angry with this Jew. How can he take a prayer book and use it 
to take away another Jew's last piece of bread. I am not going to pray if this is how religious Jews behave. In Bergen and Mauthausen, they use a prayer book in order to manipulate people to give them their last piece of bread. I will not be part of this. As Simon Wiesenthal turned to walk away, Rabbi Lazar Silver tapped him on the shoulder and he says in Yiddish, I, the Bistanar, the Bistanar, which bluntly means, you're foolish, you're foolish. Wiesenthal was intrigued. Why are you calling me foolish? Call me secular, call me apathetic, call me assimilated, call me angry. Why are you calling me foolish? And Reblaze Silver told him these words. You know, my fellow Jew, he said, why are you looking at this manipulative Jew who rented out his siddur to take from people their last meals. Why are you focusing on this person? Why don't you focus on something else? Why don't you look at the dozens of Jews who were ready to give up their last morsel of bread in order to be able to use a prayer book, to be able to talk to God? Why don't you look at these extraordinary people who in spite of all their suffering, felt that they can connect to their creator. People who had nothing left to their lives, but they knew one thing they still had left, and that is an indestructible relationship with their creator that could never be shattered. And for this, they were ready to give up everything. Why don't you focus on that rather than on this one person who was maybe behaving or behaving in an inappropriate way? Simon Wiesenthal nodded, he turned around, and he joined the prayer service with Rabbi Silver, and he shared this story 60 years later with European rabbis in the 1990s who honored Simon Wiesenthal. Here you have it, my dear friends, what it means to have a personal relationship with God, to know that in all circumstances, God is your best friend. God is always with you. I may not understand him. I may not be able to wrap my brain around God, but I always know that he's ready for a conversation. I know that he's there to hug me, to listen to me. God often challenges me, challenges me in very, very profound ways, but the challenges are never there to destroy me and crush me they're there to bring out the best in me and to allow me to shine my light on the world. Yes, sometimes I can't feel it. Sometimes I'm feeling all these other types of emotions which are normal and human. And yet, if God is worth worshiping, it's not a God whom I can contain in my limited two pound or three pound brain. It's not a God who I can reduce to my own expectations and my own imagination. It's a God who's infinite, who is the infinite source and cause of all of existence, and who challenges me and invites me every single day to be in a relationship with my deepest core. What is my deepest core? My deepest core is the core of my life and the core of all of life, which is Hashem God. A personal relationship with God means above else, above all else, a personal relationship with yourself, your deepest self, your innermost self, the core of your entire reality, because if the doors of perception are cleansed, everything appears as is, infinity. You are an ambassador of that infinity in the world, and every day you're capable, and I'm capable, of building a relationship with that dimension of self, which then allows each and every one of us to become an ambassador of love, light, hope, and healing. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Wallach. Um, so I have some questions here. Um, I'm going to tell you the questions. Um, I also want to just mention that um, in, in Queens today, we, we lost a very special rabbi, Mordecai Rachmino. 
um, who's very close to all of us, to many of us here in Queens, um, in the Bukhari community and all around. He was actually Nifter in Israel, um, and so uh, he went to visit his family uh, around the current time this year. Um, it uh, should be in our prayers as well. Um, so, I have a question here. As a young single living alone, I've been trying to figure out how to deepen my relationship with Hashem. It seems like I'm doing all the things that everyone tells you to do. Shabbat, live without a kid or a home, connect with friends and family, but I'm still feeling out of touch. What does Hashem want me to do? How old is this person? You started to say as a young what? As a young... As a young single living alone. Okay. Let me tell you what I think is an answer to your question. And that is, and and I think it should be it should be understood by all of us. What is Hashem? When we say a relationship with Hashem, what is this Hashem that we're talking about? I really want we should understand what it means. What do we mean by this? And the answer, of course, is, and uh, this is so critical to understand. When this person asks a question, what am I supposed to do to have a relationship with Hashem? I daven, I pray, I do all these things, and nothing is happening. Who is this Hashem? (laughs) Hashem is the essence of life. Hashem is another word for reality. The reality of reality, that is Hashem. It's the core of existence. It's the core of reality, which means Hashem is you, and you are Hashem. It doesn't mean there's no Hashem outside of you, but it means there's no you outside of Hashem. Because we all are living in reality. We are all part of reality. We are all an aspect of reality. And the reality of reality, that is God. That is the divine. That is the meaning of the words, Ein oid malvadai. There's nothing outside of him because everything in the world is in reality. It's an aspect of divine energy. It's a manifestation of divine energy. Every living organism lives with the DNA at the nucleus of the cell, which basically is at the core of every living existence. Those are letters which at their core are manifestations of divine energy. And the same is true every single cell in every living organism, from the bee to the mosquito, from the lioness to the elephant, from the hyena to the chimpanzee. Lahavdil, the human being, every single cell is a manifestation of divine energy. And the same is true with every bush and every tree and every shrub and every plant, every grain of sand, droplet of rain, flake of snow, every star and every galaxy, the micro and the macro are essentially manifestations of divine energy. So you know what a relationship with God means? A relationship with God means a relationship with yourself, with your ultimate self, with your truest self. So what I'm going to encourage you to do is start trying to have, try to begin developing a real relationship with yourself. Cut away all your external layers. Do you know how to do that? Shed all those parts that are not real. Do you have one person in your life whom you can have a real conversation with? about your deepest vulnerabilities, about things that bother you in the profoundest way, about who you are at your core. When you begin to remove the cover-ups, with each day you will be able to develop a relationship with God because God essentially is the core of you. Thank you, Rabbi. Um, I have another question here. Um, yeah, go ahead. What should I do when I feel kind of dumb telling God what's happening in my life when he knows it all already and we made it all happen? <laughs> okay. Excellent, excellent question. <laughs> you really don't have to feel dumb. You know, if uh, 
if your if your child comes home from school, you remember the days when your kids used to go to school, right? And something happened in school. And you may know exactly what happened because the principal called you. When your child comes home from school and says, Mommy, Daddy, I want to share with you what happened in school. Do you tell your child, Oh, I know everything. Don't tell me nothing. I know everything. A parent doesn't do that. You don't do that. You welcome the conversation because it's not about if you know or not. It's about the relationship. Let's say my, my son got into a fight in school or misbehaved in school or had a difficult day in school. And the principal called me. I know everything. And then my boy comes home and he says, Tati, I have to share with you what happened in school. Do I say, oh, Moshe, don't share anything. I know everything. Go to your room. I don't have to know everything. I know everything. <laughs> That's the worst thing you can do as a parent. You may know the information, but you're looking for the relationship. You want your son to be able to share everything with you because that means he trusts you. And that means you can trust him. And that means you can brainstorm together how to recreate the situation and how to develop him or her into the person that knows how to deal with the various challenges that come across in life. That's the idea of prayer. You don't have to inform God of the facts. It's, it's ex re-experiencing the facts and presenting them to your loving father, to your loving mother. It's an entirely different concept. You're not giving God information. You're sharing with God your soul, your experience, your essence, your feelings, your emotions, and God cherishes that because he's not looking for information. He's looking for the relationship. Okay, thank you. Somebody is asking a question. What yeah. are practical ways to build relationships with ourselves in order to become closer to Hashem? What's practical ways of building relationships with ourselves? A few things. Number one, to be able to spend to be able to have people or at least a person in your life in whose presence you can think out loud. You need to have people in your life with whom you can be completely and brutally honest, whether it's a spouse, a close friend, a confidant, a therapist, a counselor, a rabbi, a rebetzin, a teacher, a mentor, but one or two or three people whom you can really lay your soul beer. It's so, so important. The, the Mishnah says, acquire for yourself a teacher and a friend. To be able to have that relationship, it allows you to be able to see what is going on in you and not to be afraid. We are often so afraid of what's going on inside of us. So that's number one. Number two, it's important to spend time with yourself. Spend time with yourself. Spend time with yourself means not texting and not WhatsApping and not watching another video and not busy answering emails, but spending each day time with yourself, looking into yourself. Meditation, mindfulness is helpful. Exercise is helpful. Prayer is helpful. Learning is helpful. All these things where you really retreat back to your core and you simply spend time with your innermost self. And a lot of interesting things will come up. Another very important thing is to make time to meet your anxiety as though you're meeting a friend by an appointment. To really make time, you can't always do it, sometimes you're busy with something, but to make time to meet your fears, to meet your insecurities, to meet your anxiety, and really like have a conversation with it. To listen to it, to respect it, not to judge it, and to find out what is going on because you will learn a lot of things about yourself. Another very, very important component is to be able to challenge yourself. If there are teachers or books or writers who speak to your soul and resonate with you, learn from them, read them, listen to them, watch them, grow. That way you will continuously grow. These are some basic ideas that I think can help any of us to develop a deeper relationship with our core, with our core selves. Rabbi, I have a few more questions, but maybe you want to take one or two from your, from your Okay. We have over here, a lot of questions came in through the yeshiva.net, so let me see. 
what's going on. Okay. Uh, how do we know that what we individually feel down here is replicated by God above? Meaning, I'm happy, he's happy. I am sad, he is sad. Well, there's a very famous expression in the Zohar that the proverb says, my face that I reflect to the water, the water reflects back to me. And the same is true with God, that the face I reflect to God, he also reflects back to me. That's why there's an expression in Yiddish, trach gut gut. Think positive, and that creates positivity. When you're in an upbeat mood, when you're a happy person, you open up new channels because the universe responds to you. It's like the law of attraction, but from a much more, uh, even a much more spiritual point of view and perspective, that my attitudes are not just my own attitudes. The human being is the interlacing link between heaven and earth. So when your heart is open and when your mood is open, and when you open yourself up to faith and hope and happiness and joy, your moods and your feelings and your emotions reverberate through the cosmos and through all of the worlds. And just like a mirror, you see what you're showing the mirror. You show the mirror a smile or a sour face. That's what you get back. And that's a very powerful idea in Jewish mysticism. Hashem Tzilcha, God is your shadow. So the Baal Shem Tev said, the shadow follows you. So very often, you're not just a victim, you're a full partner. You're a full partner with God. Can the rabbi give us some clarification? About very difficult situations in life. I have very difficult situations in life that God gave me. He rescued me also with great kindness. I don't have a problem with loving God. I have a problem with fearing God. I know that God is kind and forgiving, but how am I supposed to develop fear of God? I don't want to fear God. I want to love God, not fear God. It's a great question. And the answer to your question is, I'm going to say two points. Point number one is, what does fearing God mean? Fearing God doesn't mean that you're fearing God because he's unpredictable and he's a tyrant and he's going to punish you and he hates you and he's going to take revenge. Fearing God really means... I'm fearful of ruining such a powerful relationship. You know, when you have an amazing relationship with somebody, you're afraid of doing something that's going to damage the relationship. And that's what fear of God means. Fear of God means I'm afraid to ruin such an amazing relationship. It's too good. It's like you have, if you have an incredible friendship or an incredible marriage, you can cheat on your friend. You can speak behind his back. You can gossip, you can slander, you can, excuse me, backstab him or backstab her. You can lie. Maybe nobody will even know. But you're afraid. Why are you afraid? Even if they'll never find out and they won't punish you. You're afraid of ruining such an amazing gift that you have in your life. How can you, how can you be so insensitive and because of a temptation ruin such a powerful relationship? That's one element of fear. Another element of fear is when you realize how much God loves you and how much he's crazy about you, it becomes pretty scary. <laughs> Meaning if you could love me so, so much, that's like pretty scary. You know, if you wouldn't love me so much, it's like, okay, I can do whatever I want. But if you love me so much and you're so connected to me, it's like, wow, that's a pretty scary thought. That's another idea. Of, of fear of God. So fear of God shouldn't be seen as a, a negative thing. It's a very, very noble, it's a very, very noble emotion and feeling. And it's a very important quality in life. There's the element of, there's the element of love and there's the element of, of, of awe, of, of fear, of reverence, of respect, as I explained. Dina says, it seems like a one-way relationship between us and God. We talk, God listens. He never encourages us. He never tells us to keep going. He keeps us alive. Everything we have is from him, but he doesn't seem to answer us directly. <laughs> there was once a fellow <laughs> who came to a rabbi and he said, you know, nobody in the world thinks about me. I'm all alone. 
Nobody ever, ever even has a thought to think about my well-being. And the rabbi tells him that there was once a fellow who came to his therapist and he says, you know, <laughs> nobody ever thinks about me. I'm alone in the world. And suddenly, suddenly, a hundred billion white blood cells popped up and they looked at this fellow and they said, what are we, chopped liver? And of course, what they meant to say is that you have approximately maybe more, a hundred billion white blood cells, which are like policemen. They travel through the entire body and they're basically the security, like police. They patrol your organism in case an invader might come in, an infection, bacteria, a virus. And when the invader does come in, they immediately mobilize to attack. This, don't say nobody is thinking about you ever when there's a hundred billion little guys who are working day and night, 24 hours a day, seven days a week from the moment you're born until the last breath at 120 to make sure you're fine. When you say that it's a one-way relationship with God, if you mean that we don't hear God's voice, that's true, we don't hear God's voice. But every single moment of life, every experience of life is God talking to us, is God communicating with us. We just have to clean out our antennas so that we should be able to open ourselves up to that vibe. The energy and the presence of God is in everywhere and in everything. However, if my ears are plugged or this static in my brain, I can't hear it because I am in a much smaller place. When you clean out your antennas, you open your ears, you open your eyes, you cleanse your spirit every day, you become open to experiencing this relationship and then you will see that the relationship is constant. And the more you open up to it, the more you'll be able to experience because the relationship is always there. God is always, always present. Rabbi Kiva, do you want me to read more? I have here 17 questions, so maybe it's your turn. No, you can read more. I should read more? Yeah. Okay, a lot, a lot of questions came in. Okay, here's the next question. Uh, okay, thank you for the thank yous. You speak about connecting to God and connecting to your inner self and finding this opportunity to find your core. Let's face it, this is a chaotic and busy time. Men who are usually busy davening in shul, learning and working are now sharing the burden of children at home with their wives. They can't learn normally, they can't pray normally. How are you supposed to connect to your inner self? We can't even think straight. We're all overwhelmed, we're all busy, we're all occupied, we're doing things we never used to be doing. Come on, this is a question from a man named Shia or Joshua. Excellent question, excellent question. Okay, I know every single person is in a different situation. There are people who are literally home alone. There are people, maybe older couples who are home, just two people, or people who, children already, you know, the nest is empty. So I know so many people are in different places. But let me tell you something. Even if your house is very, very chaotic and very, very busy, that's part of connecting to your core self because now we're given an opportunity to deal with issues that we didn't have to deal with. You know, all the issues in marriages. He used to run to work, she ran to work. They only saw each other at night. Now you're together a whole day. It's such an opportunity to figure out what, uh, what's going on, to get rid of some of the skeletons, some of the ghosts, some of the demons, to be able to take time every day and spend time with each other. If you can take a walk, that's great. If you can't take a walk, depends where you live and what the health officials say. But it's so important now to focus on issues in your marriage that you didn't have time to focus on, or you weren't forced to focus on. The same is true with your children. You get to see your children a whole day. You get to listen to your children. You get to see the interactions. I don't mean connecting to your core self in the Buddhist model of going on top of a mountain and meditating and fasting and spending time with nirvana and one and all, all in one. I know some of our homes are very chaotic. I'm talking about connecting to your core self in the chaos and in the busyness by noticing your emotions, by learning to control your temper, by identifying your anxiety, by figuring out what's really bothering you. And you know, it's so important not to be scared of any emotions. Respect your emotions, whatever they may be, as chaotic as they may be. 
give them their space, and then choose to live a life based on your values. Your wife or your husband may say something that triggers you and you want to explode. Your teenage son or daughter says something and you want to explode and you would usually run out of the house and go to work. And now you can't. It's such a great opportunity for you to be able to observe your emotions, to see what's happening, and for you to be able to choose what is your right path, how you should respond verbally, which thoughts should take over your brain based on your innermost values. So this is such an opportunity for self-refinement, for self-discovery, for searching inside your soul and becoming a transformed person amidst the chaos and amidst the busyness. That's how, that's how I that's how I see it. How can you have, Isaac, how can you have a relationship and an intimate one with God? God is not visible. He's not a person. He's not a thing. We have no frame of reference what God is. Are we supposed to invent an image of our imagination? I think this is one of the reasons that boys and girls are leaving Judaism, because they're all like robots. They're doing things with no feelings and no connection to God. This is Isaac's question. Wow. Great question, Isaac. I love it. I love it. Rabbi Rottenberg, that's a good question, no? Excellent, excellent, excellent question. So let me let me uh, let me respond very briefly. I think I addressed some of this during the lecture. I know God is not visible. God is not a person. God is not a thing. You're not supposed to invent any image, but that's exactly the point. If God would have an image, it would mean that connecting with him is limited to a certain style, to a certain time, to a certain place. Because, because God has no image, it means that my relationship with him is never limited because it never has to look a certain way. A relationship with God doesn't mean I'm in a good mood or I'm in a spiritual mood or I'm in an uplifted mood. A relationship with God doesn't mean I'm black or I'm white or I'm orange or I'm yellow or I'm blue or I'm brown. A relationship with God doesn't mean I'm in a specific space or box or model. A relationship with God means... Wherever you are at this moment, wherever you are physically, emotionally, psychologically, socially, spiritually, you are one with God because God has no image. He has no place. He has no figure. There's no space that God runs away from or God says, oh, I can't deal with this. Or God says, no, this is the way to connect to me. Wherever you are in the world, right now, right there, right then, you can open yourself up to the fact that at your core, you are divine, you are one, you are infinite. Let's remember, relationship with God means discovering what it is. You want to know God, get to know your deepest, deepest core. And again, this doesn't mean there's no God outside of you. There is a God outside of you. It means there's no you outside of God. The Navi says, Job says, Mipsari echze eloika, Iyoiv. From my own flesh, I shall perceive Hashem. Beautiful words. The Balatanya said, You have to sand the bruteness of your flesh until you'll be able to perceive God over there. I would say, however, very important qualification, many of us relate to God only through images. We paint a picture of God when we're a child, and that picture sticks with us forever. And if our image of God is a negative one or a scary one, it paralyzes us, and it limits our ability to experience a mature and infinite relationship with God. That's why I'm going to ask you, Isaac, and all of you to do an exercise. Think, what is the image that comes up in your mind instinctively when you say the word God, without thinking about it? If there is an image that comes up immediately, it may teach you a lot about what is the obstacle in your relationship with God. I completely agree with you, Isaac, that boys and girls from a very young age need to be taught about cultivating their own relationship with Hashem wherever they are. This is vital. Children understand infinity much better than we think they understand. And I want, you to rem I want to remind you the words of God to Moses when he stood at the burning bush. Moses said, let me go see what is happening at the bush. And God said, no, 
take your shoes off your feet because the place upon which you stand is sacred soil. Teaching Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, you don't have a relationship with God by running to the burning tree. You have to discover how the place upon which you stand is sacred. You have to be able to find that the presence of Hashem is always inside of you right now, right here, and I could connect to that truth under every single condition and in all in, in the, under all circumstances. My grandmother passed away three years ago. There is a metaphor that the angel of death uses other things not to take the blame because he was worried that everybody will blame him. So God said, don't worry, they'll blame the doctors, the hospitals. When my grandmother passed away, I didn't blame the illness that she had. I blamed the angel of death. I'm angry that she was taken away. What could you do to help me calm down from my anger? Whew. That's a very, very good question, Jelly or Gelly. And... Uh, when somebody close to us is taken away, it's very, very, very hard. And that anger is, is part of the human condition. You're angry. You're very, very angry. Under the anger, you're very, very sad, and you're in a lot of pain. And I'm sorry, this is, this is very, very difficult. And I know you say it was three years ago, but when you're very, very close to somebody... Three years is not always a long time. And what I want to tell you is that I think the most important thing to remember is that your grandmother died physically, but her soul is eternal. And ask yourself how your grandmother would want you to live. Do you think your grandmother would want you to live with perpetual anger? Or your grandmother would want you to know that her soul is eternal? She's still here for you. She prays for you, she thinks about you, she loves you, and you could connect to her, and you can be there for her soul, because every time you bring in goodness into this world, you elevate and you inspire and you bring joy to her soul. So think about what your grandmother would want from you of how to live today. What would be the greatest tribute for this wonderful lady who obviously was wonderful because I see how much you love her. Aviva, God, okay, the next question is, uh, wow, a lot, a lot of questions, okay. How, you wanna go Rabbi Rottenberg? Okay. Excellent question. And I think the I think a very I think a very, very important answer to this is what you could do is <clears throat> Don't, it doesn't have to be big and dramatic. Let me give you a few simple exercises and steps. When you wake up in the morning, there's a lot going on, but you can open your, you open your eyes and you put together your hands and you say that little powerful meditation and affirmation that Jews say right when they wake up. Maidani lefanecha melechai v'kayam shechizar tabi I thank you, Hashem, for giving me back my soul with compassion. Great is your faithfulness and trust in me. What a beautiful way to open yourself up to a new day. You acknowledge that you were given a soul. You acknowledge that you are an ambassador of God for this day. You acknowledge how much God believes in you. You wash your hands and you say the blessings. And when you say the blessings, the brachas in the morning, I'm gonna ask you, do it with an English prayer book so you could see the translation. Listen to these words. Eloikai, neshama shanasata bi tahoirahi, atavarasa atayitzarta, God, my God, the soul you have imbued within me is pure 
And Tahira also means it's light. In Aramaic, Tahira means luminescent, bright which means the soul you have given me is filled with light because it's God's light in this world. Focus on these words. It takes a few seconds, but stop, 10 seconds, and think about the fact. Think about the fact that inside of you there is God's infinite light. And then you thank God for all the things that we thank him in the morning. The ability to see and the ability to walk and the ability to step on the ground, and the ability to flex and stretch our muscles, and the ability to stand up, and the ability to have wisdom, and the ability to experience another day. Those are very small, short, but powerful, powerful meditations that we're saying every day. And if you could take four, five, six minutes, do it slowly with a translation so you understand what you're doing, and focus on it with sincerity, you are in a, an amazing relationship with Hashem. That's what a relationship is. One day, God willing, you'll get married. What do you think a relationship with your spouse is? These are what relationships look like. This is the stuff of a relationship. And then you ask God, Save me. From people who are unscrupulous. From chutzpah. May Adam ra chavera shachin ra pegera ayin hara lashin hara edus sheker sinas abrias. You're asking God to save you from a social life that is inappropriate, from gossip, from slander, from saying lies, from hating people. May chaloyim from illness. Such powerful, beautiful words giving you focus. You tell God vaharev nas divrei sarascha befinu. Make the words of your Torah sweet in my mouth. I should be able to appreciate the sweetness of your Torah. This is right even before davening, just a few minutes. You say this with a little concentration, sincerity, meditation, every single morning, and you become a different person. You become a conscientious person, a reflective person, a good person, a noble person. You become an ambassador of Hashem in this world. And I would also suggest that when you daven, Every day, take one paragraph of Davani and learn its translation. Read it with your mouth or with your eyes with a translation that you'll understand. For example, tomorrow, take the prayer, the blessing, Ahavas Oilam, or Ava Rabba, if you do with Ashkenaz, right before Shema, and focus on the translation, just that paragraph. Every week, focus on another paragraph. Sooner or later, you'll get to know the Davening. And you'll see it will be a different experience. Rabbi, I'm with you. Amazing, amazing. Do you want to take one or two more? Okay, I'll take one more here. I'll take one more here. Let's see what's coming in. Um, a few more came in, but let me, uh, I could take, let's see what's going on. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay, please repeat the question. I'm repeating the question. Okay, let's see here. What is your advice? My natural feelings tend to go towards a self-identity, as the rabbi described. I'm small, petty, finite, moody, struggling. Praying is going to change my perspective. What if I try every day to have kavana, but to no avail? How do I get out of this view of myself? How do I step away from my traumas? How do I become an ambassador of God? Hmm, I like that. Okay, I think you really have to expose yourself to a deeper dimension of Judaism. I think you are... You're used to a very uh, narrow perspective of Judaism and of yourself. And I think it's important for you to explore a Judaism that really sees you as one with Hashem, as an ambassador of Hashem. Because if you don't have this information, when you daven, you're coming from a wrong reference point. I shouldn't say wrong, from a smaller reference point. I think the more you will learn about the spiritual dimension of Judaism, and the loving dimension of Judaism, and the infinite love that God has to you, the more you'll be able to change your thoughts. And when I mean change your thoughts, I don't mean that you destroy other thoughts. 
any thought that comes in, you let it be, but then you gently shift your brain to another way of looking at it. So if you could stand back and observe what your mind is doing, you can make choices. How do people have choices? Only if they know that there's more than one highway. If there's only one road I'm used to traveling from here to there, I have no choice. But if I step back and I say, oh, there's another road, now I can choose. The problem is you're so engulfed, we are so engulfed by the thoughts. I'm petty, I'm a nobody, I'm traumatized, I hate my life, nobody likes me, I'm not going to be successful. I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about me and many of us. Okay, those are thoughts, but you are not your thoughts. You're not your thoughts. These are thoughts inside of you, they are not you. Step out of them and observe that these thoughts are flowing through you, but they're not you. And you know what? You can look at another way of seeing it and saying, you know, maybe I'm not petty. Maybe I'm invincible. Maybe there's a part of me that's indestructible. Maybe there's a part of me that's confident, powerful, happy, wholesome, splendid, sacred, beautiful, moral, infinite. Maybe. No, I know you. You're an idiot. You're a schlamazel. You're a petty little nobody. You're a loser. You're a quetch. Okay, my dear thoughts. Thank you, faxi driver. Observe them. Don't become them. Observe them. And when you observe them, you could let them be. And then you could say, but there's another way of looking at it. And then you can choose how you want to live. The more you learn about another self, the more you'll have a choice to dive in and connect to that self. That's why I will suggest to you that you try to start dedicating time to learn the spirituality of Judaism. If you appreciate my classes, we do a lot of classes on these topics. You can come learn more on the yeshiva.net for my classes. Especially, I think you would do well with the texts of Hasidic spirituality, Hasidus because they really tune into this dimension of the self. This would be my personal suggestion to you. If you're part of Emmet or you want to be part of Emmet, Rabbi Rittenberg's classes follow a lot in this line. And these are important perspectives because they will help you see yourself in a much, uh, in a much deeper way. Not that you don't struggle anymore, but that you could see that there's other ways, you know, and then you can develop new neural pathways because the problem is freedom is a muscle. Use it or lose it. Our neural pathways develop in a certain way and then we don't know there's anything else. But when you can see another perspective, you could start exercising different highways in your brain. And with neuroplasticity, you actually expand the way you start looking, looking at the world. Ephraim, relationships, obedience, personal limits. How can I explain to my children these concepts when they're growing? And the answer to this is you have to explain it to them from a very deep place of caring and love. It's not about obedience in order to satisfy your impulses. It's obedience and relationships and personal limits in order to be able to create a safe and reliable environment with, which can teach them responsibility and teach them about their abilities and that they can create their lives by identifying the causes and the consequences. Great, Rabbi, I have a question from a very close friend of mine. Go ahead. I, I think this is something we all can relate to. She says, how can I focus on my prayers when my mind wanders um, during this part. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's uh that's a very very uh that's a very good question. So first of all, my dear friend, welcome to the club. Uh our minds wander. It's extremely important that before you start davening for a few minutes you prepare yourself. That may mean that may mean a little meditation. It may mean a little mindful exercise. It may learn. It may mean learning something or reading something that helps you get in tuned with Hashem. Again, texts of Jewish spirituality are usually very, very helpful for this. And then when you daven, try 
to focus on the words in a calm, gentle, and joyous way. Your mind will, will, will go away, and you know what? That's going to happen, and then slowly and gently with compassion, say, now come back. Don't feel guilty. Don't get angry. Don't get into a bad mood. Don't start feeling like a loser. This is the natural thing that the mind does. It goes here. It goes there. A lot of other voices come in, and I'll tell you something. When you're having a very good davening, sometimes at the peak, your mind drifts away in the most radical fashion. You know why? Because if I'm having an arm wrestle with you, right? I'm having an arm wrestle, and I'm winning, I'm winning, I'm winning, I'm winning, and you're almost down, 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 and the last moment, you get this new burst of energy, right? And you throw me back, and uh, what happens? When you see you're losing, you get this new adrenaline, and burst of energy, so you really start fighting back because you want to survive, you want to win. The same is true in our own life. We have two souls, and they battle during davening. And when we're winning, the other side, the animal soul, the HR, says, oh, I'm not going to let this happen. And he fights back. And when you're feeling that resistance, it often means that you're actually doing well. So let it be, and tune in to your soul slowly and gently. So as your mind shifts away, which is very, very normal, come back, bring back your mind to the words. It's very helpful if you have a sitter where you can understand what you're saying. Because if you can understand what you're saying, your mind can be focused on the prayer. If not, you're just saying words, and it's very hard to connect to the energy. There is a concept of connecting to the energy of the words like mantras. It's discussed by the Hasidic masters and the Kabbalists. But it's easier if you can understand the meaning. And then you create a mindset and you start davening. And when your mind goes back, just bring it back. And it happens again and again and again. And the more you practice it, it's like exercise, muscles. You use it and it grows. You don't use it and you lose it. The same is true with prayer. I use my mind. I concentrate. The more you do it, you'll see the more delightful it becomes. And you'll see something else. When you have a meaningful davening, where you try to stay focused, you emerge from davening a much happier person, a deeper person, because your relationship with your soul is so much more powerful. Somebody says here, Razel, everything you're describing doesn't apply to me. <laughs> That's the way I feel. How can I change that? <laughs> and how does one feel Hashem's care and love? How do you know that it's real and it's not fake? Okay, great question. First of all, you'll forgive me, but with great love, I'm going to disagree with you. I don't think it doesn't apply to you. I think it does apply to you. I think that you're not used to looking at yourself this way. But I think it really, really applies to you. I think that you are probably a very deep soul and a very spiritual soul. But it's also possible, and I want to say this, and you'll forgive me, I'm going to be a little blunt. A lot of Jews I know are traumatized by davening. They hear the word davening and it triggers a negative emotion. I'll tell, them, I'll tell you why. Some of us sat through school for 5, 10, 15 years and the davening was long and you weren't allowed to get up from your chair and you were so bored that for the rest of your life, the word davening or the prayer book brings up a very, very negative or at least a boring emotion. It's like, here we go, an hour of boredom. You know, people talk about not speaking in shul, not speaking in shul, not talking in shul. And it's very, very important. What's the reason, though, people talk in shul? They don't find it relevant. They don't find the joy in their davening. There's no experience. Nothing is happening. It's just dead. So why shouldn't they have a conversation? <laughs> I was once in a shul, and, uh, <laughs> and there was some talking. So I asked the chevra to be quiet. So somebody says, he says, Rabbi, why, why? I don't understand you. You think I come to shul to be quiet? I could do that at the house. In my house, I could be quiet. I come to shul to talk to my friends. 
What do you want from me? I'm home. I come to shul. I want to socialize. That's interesting. You talk about the market. You talk about what's going on. You talk about interesting stuff. You talk politics. You talk challenge. Whatever you talk. Take a little stickle herring or stickle cake. Could I blame people? Talking by davening, it's really the time that Hashem turns to a Jew and says, I want to hear what's going on in your life. Here is a time we're going to meet face to face intimately. Let's talk, let's hug, let's schmooze, let's chill out together, let's hang out, let's wrestle, let's embrace each other. And I'm in a conversation, but I understand that some people find it so boring, and this is not judgmental, but it's a reality. For some people, it's so, so boring. And maybe this is a great opportunity when you're not in shul to learn how to daven, because it's only you and God. Nobody's watching. The rabbi is not watching. President is not watching. The gabba is not watching. Shamash is not watching. Nobody is watching. Your wife is not even watching from the women's section. She may be watching from another port room in the house. It's now you and God alone. But you know what? It's an incredible opportunity. You could actually discover how to talk to Hashem. And you know what? I tell people, talk to Him in your own language. Do you know that the, the Shulchan Aruch, the Code of Jewish Law, says that in Shema Kailenu, in the blessing of Shema Kailenu, you could talk about whatever you want. You could talk about Corona. You could talk about your children. You could talk about your marriage. You could talk about your business. You could talk about your anxiety. You could talk about your parents. You could talk about your skeletons. You could talk about your past. You could talk about your issues. And you could speak in any language. In Shema Kailenu, you could speak about everything. And in other blessings, you can also add texts. Let's say Rifa'enu, you could speak about themes that are connected to that blessing. You could speak about health. Shema Kailenu, you could talk about anything. But every other blessing, you can bring up any theme that's connected to that blessing and talk about it for 10 minutes. You use the opportunity. Talk, talk, talk to God. Fight it out. Fight it out. Argue it out. And you know what? Hashem won't interrupt you like a good, good therapist. He will let you go till the end. He will not interrupt you ever. He will let you finish. He never says, okay, enough, be quiet. You want to speak? I'm here to listen. And then Hashem gives his answer when he's ready to give his answer in his own unique, inimitable way. Okay, Rabbi Rottenberg, I think we're good. Or you want to do more? Rabbi, thank you so much. It was amazing. Thank you. I just want to conclude and thank thank Emmet for Emmet Outreach Center for this great opportunity. And I love you all and I bless you all. And I thank you all for being here. And I wish you only, only the best. And really to, uh, you know, we all know that this is, this is a difficult time, but it's so important not to forfeit the tremendous opportunities that we have every crisis has a silver lining and really use this time to enhance your marriage to work on your relationship with your children to work on your relationship with yourself to work on your relationship with Hashem to become a much a, a newer person a better person a more real person and a more refined person this is a time to get out of our gullus mentality our exile exile pettiness and open ourselves up to a consciousness of Geula, to a consciousness of infinity, to a consciousness of, uh, of redemption. I do want to finish with one last question that just came in through the yeshiva.net because it's very meaningful. It came in from Natalia, Natalia. And she says, I did not experience my father. My father was a survivor of the war with his own trauma. And therefore, I never knew what it means to have unconditional love. I never could connect with a sense of God as a loving father unconditionally. I'm accustomed to judgment and criticism. How can I be helped to feel Hashem's love constantly, no matter what? What a beautiful and important question, Natalia. Thank you for questioning this, for bringing this up, and I'm going to answer and conclude with this. The answer is the words of King David in Psalms 27. We say it in the month of Elul and Tishrei. Ki avi ve'imi azavuni v'hashem ya'asfeni. My father and mother have abandoned me, King David says, but Hashem took me in. 
And what King David is teaching all of us is that sometimes in life, when we did not grow up with role models who can model unconditional love, you have to find it within your own relationship with God. It is so important to be able to reinvent yourself from that place. And the way to do it is every single day, when you dive in, in the morning, you say, focus and tell yourself, Take a deep breath and say to yourself, whether verbally or in your thoughts, God, you have given me a piece of you. And as a result of that, you are with me at every single moment. In the prayer before Shema, we say, Ahavas oilam ahavtonu. You have loved us eternally. And we employ the term love seven times in one paragraph. And we finish, You choose your nation with love. And then you say, In the prayers before we start davening, known as Birchas HaShachar, we speak about, from the infinite love that you loved him and the joy that you celebrated with him, you called his name Israel. And this, each and every one of us is empowered to say every morning. So every day, my dear friend, make an effort and an exercise to be able to say that I know naturally my instinct is to say I'm being judged, I'm being criticized, I'm being crushed. There's a tyrant who wants to get me. God is waiting for the next mistake. Oh, I did this wrong. I did that wrong. I did that wrong. That's the Yetzir Hara speaking to you. That's the evil inclination eating up on your soul. Again, learn about the other dimension of Judaism. And then you can make a choice. And when you watch your brain going there, say, okay, my dearest friend, I know there's trauma. And I know that that's where you like going. But we are going to be revolutionaries. We are going to be innovative. And we are going to allow the brain to open itself up to different thoughts. And you know what those thoughts are going to say? Those thoughts are going to say, God loves me because I'm his child. The love is unconditional. God gives me everything I need to be able to succeed. I am an ambassador of God. At my core, I'm beautiful, amazing, splendid, incredibly powerful. God wants me to have the most successful and happy life. He wants me to suck the marrow out of life and live my life to the fullest. And then the other thought is going to say, oh, come on. We know the truth. You're a loser and you do everything wrong. Smile, develop a sense of humor and look at him and say, oh, you're back again. And now we got to go to the other thoughts. The more you will do this the more you will understand King David's words. My mother and father may have abandoned me, but Hashem Yasveini, there is always your relationship with the divine, which always is there for you to be able to sustain you, uplift you, and empower you. My dearest friends, thank you very much. Have a good night, and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Wala. I also want to just mention again, Yosef Chai, and then Yafa and Margarita about Freda that um, learning tonight should be a tremendous accomplishment in the summers. And um, Rabbi Wiley, we really appreciate your enthusiasm, your energy, and, and the fact. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.